again. So welcome on my presentation. Uh, my name is Maciej Marzenta. I work as a technical team leader at uh, Spoton. And so I have uh, more than five years of experience writing uh, um, professional Python code. So uh, on today's presentation, we'll talk about Pep8 and how to avoid being a Python hooligan. So the presentation is uh, divided. So firstly, we'll do a brief introduction to the topic. After that, uh, we'll uh, define who is actually a Python hooligan, and uh, we'll see hooligan's code. After that, we'll move into uh, seeing who is actually a Python gentleman and see his code. Then we'll answer to two questions. First is uh, what, in fact, is Pep8, and why does it matter? After that, uh, I will provide a couple of examples in the code uh, showing Pep8 in details. Then we'll discuss about tools for gentlemen. And uh, after that, we'll just uh, leave in, move into uh, conclusions and we'll have Q&A session. So let's begin. Uh, first of all, who is a hooligan? Hooligan is a person who does not follow the rules, behaves in a disruptive way, and is unpredictable. And on the other side stands gentleman a person who conducts themselves with politeness, consideration, and adherence to social etiquette. He does follow the rules, and you know what to expect from him. So the question is, which one would you like to work with? Answer is easy. The gentleman, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's define who in fact is a Python hooligan. So he, his code often lacks clarity and is hard to read due to poor organization, lack of comments, inconsistent name schemes, etc. Another thing is inefficient code. Python hooligans might prioritize result over efficient and optimized solution, leading to resource hungry, slow code. Another thing is low maintainability. Code can be difficult to maintain, update, or debug due to structure and lack of documentation. And uh, the last is he disregards conventions. So they tend to ignore the established conventions like PEP8, leading to inconsistency in their code. And here is the example of Hooligan's code. As you can see, uh, he just defined some function uh, which, uh, with name of calc. Uh, so probably it calculates something, but this is just my guess. He also uh, left some uh, really nice comment that doesn't give us uh, any value, but just takes some time to read. And there we have some uh, the x, uh, the y, the square, and at the very end it returns uh, square root of d square. And the result of that is uh, 4.24. So I will just uh, give you a couple of seconds to uh, maybe you, you can uh, actually try to understand what exactly is calculated here. Yeah, it's, it's not that easy. So let's, uh, let's move on to defining a Python gentleman. So he, uh, his code is well organized with clear variable names and comments where necessary. This makes it easy to read and understand. He also writes efficient code. So he strives for efficiency and optimization, creating code that is resource friendly and quick to execute. Another thing is high maintainability. A Python gentleman's code is designed with future modifications in mind, ensuring that any changes, updates, or fixes could be implemented smoothly and efficiently. And he does follow conventions. So he respects and adheres, adheres to established conventions like Pep8, leading to consistency in their code. And now here is the sample of gentleman's code. In fact, uh, the only difference from the hooligan code from the interpreter's perspective uh, are the arguments. Because here we are just accepting uh, two tuples, and each of the tuple uh, contains uh, the coordinates of first point. You can also see that the function name actually says that it calculates distance. What's more, you can see in the uh, doc string that it calculates the Euclidean distance between two points. So with that, you almost already know what to expect. But if you look at the body of the code, then it's even easier. Like 
he's unpacking the coordinates, he's doing some basic math and returning the distance. And the result is exactly the same. So as uh, developers, you, you probably know which code is better. But the thing is, have you ever wondered what are the rules that should be followed in order to have code looking like that instead of the code of the hooligan? And these rules actually are here in PEP8. So let's move on and answer to what is PEP8. This stands for Python Enhancement Proposal introduced by Guido von Rossum, Barry Warsaw, and Nick Kagelan on 5th of July 2001. And uh, this is an official Python style guide. So it lays out sets of conventions and best practices aimed at making your code more readable, maintainable, and consistent. Generally, by following PEP8, we can ensure that our code is easier to understand and work with, facilitating collaboration and code maintenance among developers. And why PEP8 matters? So first and foremost, PEP8 promotes code readability. This is particularly crucial when collaborating with other developers as it ensures everyone is on the same page when it comes to style and convention. Next thing is easier debugging. So readable code is easier to understand and work with, making it easier to debug and maintain. Another thing is simplified navigation because it's easier to look for the docs or just to have a lot of uh, files open in parallel. And the most important thing is efficient maintenance because as the code base grows, it can become increasingly complex and challenging to manage. Adhering to PEP8 standards ensures that your code remains organized and easy to navigate allowing for smoother development process, efficient maintenance, and easier integration of new features. So I think that I already convinced you why PEP8 matters from the developer perspective. But the question always is how to convince the stakeholders to actually allocate some time for developers to improve our code base. And I think that generally the easiest thing to, to say is that PEP8 equals to money. Because if you can uh, easily maintain the, the code and uh, you can easily add new features, that makes market advantage, which leads only to, to getting more profit for your company. Okay, now let's move on to PEP8 in details. So firstly, we'll focus on code layout. Indentation, so four spaces per indention level and prefer spaces over tabs. Uh, according to PEP8, uh, tabs should be used solely to remain consistent with code that is already indented with tabs. However, for example, in PyCharm, uh, by, default, by default it uses tabs. So as you can see, PEP8 conventions are not set in stone and they are rather a guide worth following than to, to just uh, blindly uh, stick to them. So let's see this uh, example. Generally, continuation lines in Python should align uh, wrapped elements either vertically using implicit line joining or with a hanging indent, ensuring no arguments on the first line and clear indention for continuation. So in the first example, you can see that we have long function name with four arguments and uh, foo is the, the result of this function. It's easy to see where are the arguments and what is in the, in the function. But for example, here in the long function name, the arguments uh, generally are not uh, vertically aligned, which means it's harder to, easy see, to, it's harder to see where the arguments uh, ends. Another thing is uh, adding four spaces uh, to distinguish arguments from the rest. As, as you can see in the long function name, the uh, body of this function is uh, easily distinguished uh, from the arguments, but at the very bottom, uh, at the first glance, you cannot say whether, wh when the, uh, in which point the, the body of the function uh, begins. Now let's move on to line lengths. According to PEP8, lines uh, limit all lines to a maximum of 79 characters. So 
as I already spoke, pay, pay paid was introduced almost 22 years ago, and a lot has changed uh, during that time. Right now, the average monitor with uh, 16 to 9 aspect ratio can open four files at once in a split screen. So generally, I suggest to having it uh, bigger, maybe 100 or 120. It doesn't matter that much, but it matters to have it set. So with that, it's going to be easier to integrate uh, linters that I will talk about uh, later in this presentation. And here is the example of how easy you can uh, actually see four files of the Python, which actually uh, increase the performance of code navigation and overall de development. Okay, now let's move to breaking lines. So for decades, the recommended style was to break line after binary operator. But this can hurt readability in two ways. First, the operator tends to get scattered across different columns on the screen. And second, each operator is moved away from its operand into the previous line, so the A has to do extra work to tell which items are added and which are subtracted. Actually, mathematicians had the same issue before the programmers. And they figure out that the best way is to do the opposite. And this is how the PEP8 uh, recommends it. So in the first example, it's really hard to see whether, for example, taxable interest is added or subtracted. But in the second example, it's extremely clear to evaluate what happens. All right, let's move to imports. This is easy one. The correct way is to have uh, imports on the separate lanes. So this is correct, and this is not. But uh, one thing to, to uh, remember is that if you are uh, importing multiple uh, things from the, from the library, then you can put it in the same line. All right. What is more important is the imports order. So generally, according to pep we want to group uh, the imports into the standard library that should be at the very top of the file. After that, we should have an empty line. Then we'll have third-party libraries. And at the bottom, we should have local imports. And generally, absolute imports are not recommended. They are more readable. And uh, so those imports are more readable and give better error examples, so error messages. So you should stick to. Uh, absolute imports. Okay, because I don't have a lot of time to cover everything uh, related to code convention, this is the things I skipped. So I skipped naming convention, white spaces, comments, trialing commas, and blank lines. But let's go to a second part, which is PEP8 in details, but we'll talk about programming recommendations. So, First programming recommendation from PEP8 is uh, how to do a comparison to singletons. So we always use is or is not. We are not using two uh, equals uh, uh, characters. The second thing is that use is not rather than not is. And as you can see on the first example, it's just a plain English. If foo is not none, easy. But in the second one, if not foo is none, then you actually have to think that foo is a negate, we want to uh, have a negation of foo and then to check if this is known. This is harder. Second thing is use dev statements instead of a assignment statement that binds a lambda directly to an identifier. So generally, this is more useful for trace bugs because it shows the specific, specific name of the function, which is f here. Uh, and instead of a generic identifier, which is lambda. So the use of uh, assignment statement eliminates the benefit of uh, lambda expression can offer. So generally, you should use def instead of a lambda. <coughs> and uh, for string comparisons, you should uh, use start swift and end swift instead of slicing because it's cleaner and less error prone. Now let's move on to exceptions. So regarding inheritance, uh, derive exceptions from exception class rather than base exception. Generally, direct inheritance from base class, base exception, should be 
reserved for exceptions where catching them is almost always the wrong thing to do. And second thing to, uh, to see is that don't use bare except. When catching exceptions, mention specific exception whenever possible instead of using bare except because it's really hard to catch and handle the, uh, every exception that may be uh, arised. All right, let's move to exception part two. So limit try clause. Put there an absolute minimum of necessary code. And here are the two examples. Although both of them look pretty similar and correct, only one does what we really want to do. So in the correct, correct example, we are, we are catching key error only if the key is not present in the data. However, in the second example, we are also catching all key errors that might be raised during execution of handle value. So this is probably not what we would like to have. Those are the tricky ones, but sticking to uh, limiting try clause will uh, eliminate any potential errors that might occur uh, further. And things I skipped related to call recommendations are consistency in return statements, context managers, booleans, and annotations. So now let's talk about tools for gentlemen. First are the linters. So they provide uh, code analysis. So linters play a crucial role in code analysis, providing automated checks to identify error, style validation, and potential bugs. Second thing, is, uh, second thing is that linters ensure adherence to coding standards, including PEP8 guidelines, by enforcing consistent code style and formatting convention. Also, linters can help uh, catch common coding mistakes and potential uh, issues early in the development process. And linters seam seamlessly integrate into development environments and workflows, enabling automated code analysis and providing real-time feedback for improved productivity. And those are the, the mostly common, uh, mostly known linters. First is uh, Flecate. It combines multiple checks to analyze and enforce coding style, detect uh, errors, and improve code quality. Second is uh, PyLint. This one focuses on code correctness, maintainability, and best practices, providing detailed reports and suggestions for code improvements. We also have MyPy uh, that uh, does the static type uh, checks. Uh, that, uh, and it can help uh, catch type-related errors and uh, improve code re reliability by enforcing type hints in Python code. And we have a bandit that uh, is security-focused, linter that identifies common security vulnerabilities in Python code, helping to mitigate potential risks and improve code security. And here are the examples. So here we have the code calculate sum and we are missing uh, white spaces uh, around the operators. It's really hard to find it without using an linter. But with black, uh, with flake eight, if you just uh, run flake eight, it will uh, show that missing white space around operator. And we, and we found it. Another, for example, another thing is uh, bandit. Here, we want to execute uh, command that is provided in the string. We are using OS system, and that could be really unsafe. So Bandit will uh, find it and say that use of possibly unsafe function OS system. And here is the example of, uh, uh, of MyPy. As you can see, in the greeting function, we have a type annotation that name should be a string and it returns a string. And here, if you would run the, the MyPy, it will say that uh, argument in the greeting is uh, 42, which is an integer, and this is incompatible type uh, with string. Now let's move on to code formatters. First of them is iSort. This is a tool for organizing and sorting import statements in Python code, promoting a consistent and standardized import style across the code base. And second tool is Black. 
Block, Black uh, is a code formatter that automatically formats Python code to follow PEP8 guidelines, ensuring consistent and readable code. And here are the examples of iSort. So here, uh, as I already mentioned, we want to group the imports. And with the iSort, it's done automatically. We have uh, import, we have a first group of standard libraries, we have third party library, and we have uh, some module from our application. And another thing is uh, formatting with black. As you can see, there, there is a lot of issues with uh, white spaces. And after running a black, voila, it just looks much better. So let's move to the conclusions. First of them, hooligan versus gentleman. Beware of messy code, obscure comments, and disregards for conventions. Be the gentleman and adhere to PEP8 guidelines. Benefits of PEP8. Following PEP8 guidelines improves code readability, maintainability, and debugging, ultimately contributing to the success of the project. PEP8 in the details. If you know the rules, it's not that hard to follow them. And linters and formatters. These tools make gentleman life easier by automating code formatting. You should consider using them in the project as they are really easy to integrate. And that would be it. So thank you very much. And if you would like to uh, have a contact to me or see my blog post that I am uh, writing about Python, then feel free to scan the QR code. Thank you very much. So the first one will be which linter should we be use uh, should be using on a already existing project which does not have any linters added to it. All right, all right. This is a really great question. So generally, I would uh, use iSort and uh, Black, as they are automatically will uh, refactor the code that you already have. And uh, another thing is that I would use uh, Flake Aids with the uh, plugins that are matching your project. So for example, if you are using Django, then go and look for Flake 8 Django. If you are using PyTest, go and search for Flake 8 uh, PyTest, and so on. With that, I think it's not gonna be really hard to, to have the, these tools integrated. However, if you would like to uh, also implement MyPy, well, that will, uh, that will unfortunately uh, take a lot of time. Because for the MyPy, you need to add uh, type annotations for almost everything that you have. And believe me or not, but this is really a difficult way, uh, thing to do. So yeah, black, iSort, flakes, and whatever was mentioned before, like iSort. Do you usually run linters in a hook before commits? Uh, yeah, so there are two ways. Like, uh, Generally, I use uh, uh, GitHub Actions for, the, uh, for running the linters, but actually hooks in the pre-commit is also a great way to do. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, sometimes e there could be a mismatch between the, the uh, linters versions that you put in the requirements and the, uh, the version of the library that you have in the GitHub pre-commit. Pre so if you are, if you really often change the version, then uh, I would go into CI, uh, like uh, GitHub Actions or Codefresh or whatever you are using. Okay. And this is okay. We have another one. Awesome question, actually. And this one. What do you think about breaking lines when too long? Is it a good habit or does it break readability? Uh, well. This is actually a really tricky question because as you already saw, uh, in the average monitor you can fit four uh, open files, uh, or four uh, Python files. If you wouldn't uh, break the lines, then you would have to scroll to see the whole line. And in my opinion, it's better not to scroll and see all the code than to scroll and see the code. So I would go into breaking the lines anyway. I'll ask a personal one, so about this, would you say that black default, like I think is 90 
break the line, I think it's 10 more than the page recommended. Uh, but uh, like in the pet page we have 79 or something like that, but anyway, you can just have a one configuration file and it will just work for all the linters. Thank you. Thank you.